On South Main Street in West Lebanon, near the Powerhouse Mall, there are two property markers in stone walls with initials and the date 1909. It turns out that the two men with those initials, Thomas Palmer Waterman and Frank Thomas Rexford, were important in the economic growth of the village of West Lebanon in the late 1800s through the first part of the 20th century. The village of West Lebanon was prosperous in the early 1900s. In 1907, the Granite Monthly published a story called At the Meeting of the Valleys, West Lebanon on the Connecticut. In it, it said, West Lebanon skirts the shores of the Connecticut River, extending some mile and a half along the riverbank, with streets parallel to its main highway, and these connected by others running at right angles. Where the village lies, there the three valleys of the Connecticut and Mascoma Rivers in New Hampshire and of the White River in Vermont come together. It is a meeting of the valleys, happy and serene in all its characteristics. West Lebanon is attractive in whatever direction one turns. Coursing the way southward along the river road, one soon comes to the Mascoma River, just at its junction with the Connecticut. Arriving in that hamlet, known locally as Butmanville, one is upon the ground where the first settlers, the founders of Lebanon, erected the first grist mill in the town and built their pioneer homes. They built a dam across the Mascoma, turning the entire current of the river into a long canal which carried the water, the wheel pit of the grist mill. The entire Mascoma Valley at West Lebanon is replete with attractions, combining as it does natural scenery in its most pleasing phases. On the surrounding hillsides are ancestral farms of the first settlers and stately farm buildings and well-kept fields, which speak of prosperity and contentment. In the past, the open, unimproved space between West Lebanon and the Mascoma River was considerable. Yet this present year of 1907 sees much of this area built upon and the foundations in for other houses. And at the present rate of building, it will not be long before there will be an unbroken line of homes in this section of the village. The enterprise and public spirit of West Lebanon as a community finds pertinent illustration in its well-built and well-maintained streets, sidewalks, and highways. In this respect, no community of its size in all New England can excel it. West Lebanon has a water and sewage system. The village is electric-lighted by the Mascoma Electric Light and Gas Company, the power plant of which is in West Lebanon. West Lebanon's public utilities include an efficient volunteer fire department. West Lebanon is the terminus of the northern division of the Boston and Maine Railroad, and practically every train over that road stops at its station. Its post office is of the presidential grade and has free collection and delivery of express parcels. West Lebanon may take pride in its public school system. The village is itself a high school district. The exceptional educational advantages of West Lebanon are further accentuated in that it is home to the country-famed Rockland Military Academy. Through the teaching force, the student body is offered unsurpassed advantages, whether the graduate wishes to enter college, technical school, professional school, or prepare for business, the government academies, or the civil service. The academy buildings are located on a commanding site that overlooks West Lebanon. The cadets at the academy wear a uniform that is the same of that as a West Point cadet. The presence on the streets of the cadets, individually or collectively, lends an added interest to the village life and routine. West Lebanon is preeminently a community of today, not of yesterday. It is a community of substantial men and women when measured by the standard of genuine manhood and womanhood. It offers opportunities for homes and investments that are unsurpassed, for if growth of the kind that stays comes to any point in all northern New England, it will be to West Lebanon. One of those substantial men of West Lebanon was TPW, Thomas Palmer Waterman. He was born in West Lebanon on December 10, 1842. He was the fifth of six children born to Silas and Sarah Waterman. His ancestors were among the first Caucasians to settle in the area, and his grandfather, also named Thomas, was the first male Caucasian child to be born in Lebanon. Thomas P. Waterman grew up on the family farm near where Lebanon Airport is today. He lived in the first two-story house built in Lebanon. He was educated in public school and at Kimball Union Academy. When he left the family home, he moved to the Butmanville part of West Lebanon. In his 30s, he worked as a farmer and shared a home with his sister and niece. On December 11, 1884, he married Rosamond Wood, a descendant of another old Lebanon family. She was a teacher. They had one child, a daughter, Eleanor, who died in infancy. In the late 1880s, he built a sawmill and packing box manufactory on the site of a previous mill, which had burned down. The mill was about where the powerhouse mall is now, he improved the dam that was providing water power for the sawmill. Within a few years, 
the mill was cutting about 500,000 feet of lumber per year and using from 400,000 to 500,000 feet in the manufacture of packing boxes. He later built a grist mill near the sawmill. An article written about him in the early 1900s said that his mill produced 2 million feet of lumber per year. He did a lot of business with the Diamond Match Company, which was the largest manufacturer of matches in the United States in the late 19th century. For many years, he was a dealer in builder's supplies. The Waterman Homestead, where Thomas had grown up, burned down in April 1890, and the land was sold at auction. Thomas P. Waterman owned his sawmill until around 1917. He was involved in local and state government. He served as a selectman for 16 years, as a member of the New Hampshire House of Representatives in 1878, 1879, and then in 1913, 1915, and 1917. He was a delegate in the New Hampshire Constitutional Convention in 1912. He was president of the People's Trust Company of Lebanon and a member of the number of community service organizations. He was a member of the Franklin Masonic Lodge in Lebanon for 63 years. A newspaper article in 1911 described him as having keen business judgment and can give forceful expression to that judgment. He is a hard-headed, brainy son of Lebanon, a refreshing touch of the old school, and a man to be proud of. By 1920, the Watermans were living on Mascoma Street. Rosamond Waterman died in March 1926. Thomas P. Waterman died on September 30, 1928, when he was 85 years old. Thomas, Rosamond, and their daughter Eleanor are buried in the West Lebanon Cemetery. Another of the substantial men of West Lebanon was FTR, Frank Thomas Rexford. Frank Thomas Rexford was born November 11, 1869 in Hanawa Falls, New York, to Absalom and Caroline Rexford. He was the second of five children. His siblings were Fred, Mary, Arthur, and Sidney. Frank only received a sixth grade education. One day in sixth grade, he wound the hair of the girl who sat in front of him around a tack in his desk. When she stood up to recite her lesson, he was caught and he was expelled from school. His grandfather and father both ran sawmills. Frank first worked as a sawyer in the mill run by his father, Absalom, a Civil War veteran. He married Catherine Vandenberg in 1892 when he was 21. Kitty, as she was known, was very good at oil painting and did many still lifes and landscape paintings. She was a school teacher. Frank and Kitty met because he and his brother Fred were taking a load of wood somewhere, and as they were about to pass the schoolhouse, Fred dared Frank to take an armload of wood in to the teacher. Frank replied, By gosh, I will. And he did. In 1897 or 1898, he and Kitty moved to West Lebanon, as did his younger brother Sidney about a year later, to work for Thomas Waterman and his mill. The 1900 census lists Frank working as a sawmill tender, Sidney, 19 years old at the time, was boarding with Thomas Waterman and working as a sawyer. In the 1910 census, Frank and Kitty Rexford are listed as living on South Main Street in West Lebanon, right next to the Butmanville section. This was in the house with the property marker out front. His occupation is listed as sawyer in a custom sawmill. His brother Sidney lived nearby and was a carpenter in the custom sawmill. Sidney held a number of jobs in West Lebanon over the years. Sawyer, roller operator, railroad roundhouse mechanic, and manager of a knitting mill. He eventually moved back to New York State and resettled there. In 1912, Frank and Kitty moved to Prospect Street West in West Lebanon. Frank took correspondence courses to educate himself. He studied to become a hydraulic engineer. After working in Thomas Waterman's mill for a number of years, and after receiving his engineering degree in the mid-19-teens, Frank heard about a grist mill machinery manufacturer who was looking for a salesman. He contacted them and got the job with the Sprout Waldron Machinery Company of Muncie, Pennsylvania. Frank was given the New England states as his selling territory. His work brought in a great deal of profitable business for Sprout Waldron. Customers liked to have a salesman and millwright who could both design a plant and get it running smoothly once it was built. In those days, machines were usually run from a central source, usually a water wheel, using belts and pulleys to transmit the power. The pulleys on the shafting and the pulleys on the machines had to be lined up exactly parallel or else the belts would run off the pulleys. Frank Rexford was adept at getting these machines and shafting set exactly right because he had that experience working in the sawmills. Frank did very well working at Sprout Waldron. He was able to buy two Packard automobiles and he invested heavily in the stock market. Frank's nephew Bill wrote in a letter that Frank was very generous. When Bill needed money to buy his Boy Scout uniform, 
Frank sent him the money. He always made a good appearance and was very much the professional. Kitty had become an invalid in a wheelchair, and she died on May 29, 1920. On May 16, 1921, Frank married Grace Garfield Sargent. She had done secretarial work for the Rexfords for a number of years and became friends with Frank and Kitty. Her diary notes times that they all went to the pictures together and times that she went for a drive with Kitty. She graduated from Hanover High School in 1909. She could read French and Latin. She also worked at the library and wrote some articles for the local newspaper. The Rexfords' first child, Frank Edward, was born on July 8, 1923, but died at age four in 1927 of meningitis or polio. Frank and Grace were devastated. They adopted Matlin Charles on January 16, 1928, and their third child, William Sargent, was born March 25, 1929. After losing his job with Sprout Waldron in 1928, Frank Rexford started working for the S. Howes Company as a salesman. Their introductory folder said, Our business in New England has been increasing so rapidly that it became necessary to appoint a special representative to better serve our customers' interests. We were particularly fortunate in having been able to secure as our agent Mr. Frank T. Rexford, a man who was practically brought up in the machinery business. He learned his trade under the guidance of his father, and then for a long time was associated with L. V. Rathbun, a highly skilled old-time millwright. For the past 14 years, Mr. Rexford has traveled extensively, covering practically every city, town, village, and hamlet in New England. Much of this time was occupied in designing mixed feed plants and supervising the installation of their equipment. Some of the most successful feed mills in the northeastern section of the country bear witness to his unusual mechanical ability. Besides being a natural-born mechanic, Mr. Rexford has been more successful than the average machinery salesman because of having made an intensive study of the finer techniques of the feed milling industry. We most cordially invite you to avail yourself of Mr. Rexford's knowledge and experience. In September of 1928, when Thomas Waterman died, Frank was a pallbearer at his funeral. When Frank retired from being a salesman, he built Rexford's filling station, which was on the corner of Main Street and Dana Street in West Lebanon, where the radio station building is now. The filling station also had a lunch counter and sold candy and ice cream. The Rexfords lost a lot of money in the stock market crash of 1929. During the Depression, he let people pay on credit, and he sometimes let customers barter for their purchases. To supplement the household income, the Rexfords rented rooms in their house to people who were passing by. Frank's son William wrote that many interesting people rented rooms in the house. He also wrote that Frank enjoyed communicating with people and was very kind. He was a 32nd degree mason and enjoyed working with others to help people. In 1939, still operating the filling station, Frank developed a heart problem. He went to Mary Hitchcock Memorial Hospital for treatment and rest. He returned home and went back to work. The heart problem continued through the winter and into 1940. In April, he returned to Mary Hitchcock Hospital, and he died on April 24, 1940. The funeral service was at the Rexford home on Prospect Street, attended by many relatives and masons. His wife, Grace, died in 1973. Frank, Grace, and their son, Frank Edward Rexford, are buried in West Lebanon Cemetery. <laughs>